Okay, so we're so glad you're here. Um, I'm Sarah Brumfield. And I'm Ben. And we're the creators of From the Page, which is a, a crowdsourcing platform that many libraries, archives, and museums use. And today we invited um, two of our many favorite customers <laughs> in to uh, help us talk about crowdsourcing genealogy collections. Um, you know, when we look for trends in what projects are popular and what people really love to participate in, um, collections that have a lot of genealogy related material that helps you find your ancestors um, are really popular with volunteers who, who work on these projects. Uh, so we thought we'd talk to the people who actually run some of them and see what they could share with us. Um, before we introduce Claire and Meredith, um, we wanted to mention that we do webinars about once a month and the next two we have one coming up at the towards the beginning of December that's going to be different but really interesting. Um, it's about a project at the Library of Virginia called um, Virginia Untold and specifically their free Negro registers. So they're doing genealogy data um, from uh, freed Black people in Virginia in kind of the antebellum period. Um, so super interesting material and what they're doing with, with the project and what they're doing with the output of the project is also interesting. Uh, and then in January, we've got uh, a webinar we run a couple times a year called Your First Crowdsourcing Project, where Ben and I uh, walk through kind of the soft skills of uh, how do you configure projects, how do you find volunteers, um, how do you keep them engaged. I think we'll cover a lot of that today through our conversations with Meredith and Claire, but it's kind of a, it's nice to have it laid out in kind of a structured way. So, because these projects are new for so many of us. Um, so thinking about how to run them is interesting. So uh, with that, we are going to introduce our speakers. So uh, today we have uh, two different archivists with us who've run uh, projects around material of interest to genealogists. Uh, the first is Claire Horton Eldefer. She's the deputy director of the Indiana Archives and Records Department. Um, and the second is Meredith McDonough. She's an archivist and digital assets coordinator at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. So let's get started. And for our opening question, I wanted to ask um, if you could describe the collections that you have at your institution that are most used by genealogists. Um, Claire, you're unmuted, so let you see if you'll go sure. first. <laughs> um, so at the Indiana Archives, um, we collect uh, government records. So. Um, it's not where you would find a Civil War diary, but it is where you would find the Civil War muster rolls. Um, so our genealogy collections are um, primarily um, naturalization records. That's a big one. Um, military records, state hospital, um, prison records, anything where your um, ancestor may have interacted with the state government. Um, and so then on from the page so far, we have used from the page for um, military naturalization and land records. Meredith? So I work with our digital collections, digitizing uh, physical resources that we have and describing them and putting them online. So I don't actually work much in the reference room uh, to know the answer to this question, but our former head of reference has actually come back as a retired state employee just to work on our From the Page project. So I asked her this when she was here a couple of days ago. And she said, um, she's, she's one of our premier genealogists as well. So she said, we have a, a, a partnership with Ancestry as do many state archives. And uh, when they were starting to do that work, um, they, they specifically focused on the, the genealogical collections that were most used. So those have actually already been digitized and index that way. And some of those that she mentioned were Civil War service records and muster rolls, pension applications and pension payments, our surname files, which are just uh, staff created files whenever there was a clipping or something about a person. So this is information from a variety of sources, not necessarily in a particular format. Um, convict records uh, from the Department of Corrections and also our 1867 voter registration records. Some of those we created in-house before we had from the page uh, at computer terminals, uh, our, our Civil War service records database. 
and the 1867 voter registration database. And then that's available on our site. And then we shared it with Ancestry and people who have an Ancestry account or come into the building can use those resources for free. Unlike Indiana, we're both public and private records. So we've got we've got the government records, but we also have those diaries and letters and such, uh, which are a little bit more a little bit more difficult to, to mine for information. But um, so Nancy said that our, our most heavily used collections have been digitized and indexed. And now we're kind of going through and trying to fill in those gaps and supplement with what we can do now with from the page that really wasn't feasible uh, before. Do you do you feel like you index specifically to serve genealogy researchers or are there other like I guess there's sort of what things are specific for genealogists or are there other uses of the same of the things that we've talked about that genealogists are interested in there's kind of two sides to that coin. Um, for us, I think it has primarily been um, for genealogists, um, so we have focused heavily on indexing for probably 30 years now, um, just building up indexes as opposed to digitizing. Um, and until the last couple of years, um, our our digital index site was very name-based where you really had to search for a name and you couldn't really get a result without knowing the name. So that really um, pushes it towards genealogy because you're looking for a name. Um, we migrated to a new site um, last year. And so now our site has um, a lot more capabilities as far as filtering and looking at an entire county or um, different shared characteristics that, that may be found in the indexes. And so we have started to see that there are um, more ways you could use those resources now. And um, for example, we had someone who um, wanted to uh, make sure there were military headstones for all of the veterans in a particular cemetery. And so they were able to use that to filter down to a, a cemetery um, in that way. So um, I think it has gotten wider, but, um, but generally they've been on a genealogy focus. And I think that also speaks to why we have focused on indexing as opposed to digitization. Um, mostly because maybe only one family is looking for that particular naturalization record. And so if we're able to index it so that they can find um, the basic information and, and where the record is um, found, then we can digitize kind of on demand for them. Um, but that said, with ancestry and family search um, it has become way easier to start getting things digitized. Um, Family Search just finished digitizing all of our naturalization records, um, and they're starting on our tax duplicate records. Wow. Cool. Uh, can I can I clarify something that I didn't quite understand? When you're talking about indexing versus digitization, are you talking about you know uh, indexing the the index to you know more complete records, or did I did I misunderstand that? Or just pulling certain pieces of data out of yeah both so so before we started using from the page um we had about uh, probably 25 like in-person volunteers who would go through the books and index them page by page like the actual books um and creating an index to those records and then more recently we have also started indexing indexes or you know digitally indexing indexes so that's something that has been really useful um, for us using from the page for is turning um, like a handwritten index or a typewritten index into something that's digitally searchable. Does that answer your question, Ben? That does. Thank you. <laughs> yes. But I just wanted to be clear because the only things that we see are the things that you put up on from the page. And there's all yes. these records that are behind those. That, <laughs> right. That's right. Um, I guess, Meredith, a question for you, and, and then we'll let Claire answer it too, because I think it'll be a fun story, but how did you recruit, or actually, did you recruit among your researchers, so people who are already in your archives looking for material, um, and then there's sort of the, the flip side of that, which is how do you, in general, recruit people to work on, on your transcription projects or your indexing projects? Well, our, our um, recruitment has been 
a little indirect in that, you know, we, we, a lot of our researchers are connected to our social media accounts or are already receiving our, our email updates or our publications. So I do think that a lot of our researchers learn about our projects through those avenues and then volunteer to help with them. But we're not necessarily engaging with everyone who comes in the research room to tell them about this and ask them to do it. So yes, I do think our, our researchers are part of, of who gets involved because they care about the records and they wanna be able to use them more easily but we're not specifically targeting them other than just in a general way, reaching out to genealogists, because a lot of, I think uh, the, the indexing projects in particular, we, we do it with the genealogists in mind because so much of our, so many of our researchers are doing genealogical research, but like Claire was saying, once things are indexed, they can be, you can get statistics out of them for more academic research too, more easily than you could just going page by page. And then with recruitment, like I said, we, um, we got, we've, we've been pretty fortunate in that, you know, with our World War One cards, which was the first thing that we did, um, we we didn't do a lot. We planned more, but thanks to Twitter, um, word took off. And I see at least one of our uh, volunteers with us, Ms. Brownlow. Hello. Thank you so much for all of the work that you did on that project. Um, and and we, had, we had volunteers from all over the place, which we didn't expect just because I uh, know the Alabama Genealogical Society tweeted about it, and then uh, the National Genealogical Society picked up on that and spread it. And people want to help with these projects because it, it serves everyone's it's to everyone's benefit, and we really appreciate that. And so we were surprised by how far widespread our volunteer base was because we just thought only people in Alabama would care about the Alabama records, um, when in fact people just are are very um, open hearted and and want to to help with these projects. Um, we also, we were then able, you know, take our, our volunteers from a first project and then they are interested in helping with other projects and then they just kind of move on to that. So we've done, you know, minimal recruitment, but have had uh, a good, good turnout. Uh, not all the volunteers who sign up stick with the project because I know our lives are busy and you get excited about. So I try to like most of our projects have been closed and that you have to contact us. We don't turn anyone away, but it just lets us kind of keep track of how many people or be reminded that we need to keep track of, of how many people are involved. And a lot of people are, especially with like our 1875 voter registration books, which are out now, there was a lot of interest in that initially. But it hasn't gone as quickly as, say, the World War One cards. And I think part of that is because they're so hard. <laughs> they are difficult records. I would not want, and I'm, I'm not good at recruiting, obviously. Like, <laughs> I would not want to sit there for hours. I would much rather transcribe a letter where you at least have context and can make out some of this handwriting versus every page being a different registrar. But they're critical. And we really appreciate, even though a lot of people haven't felt comfortable continuing with it, we have some really great volunteers who seem to have adopted us and uh, are, are dedicated and care about it and are uh, communicative uh, with us ab about that. Um, so that has has worked out well. It's slower, but we're, we don't have any deadlines. So we just appreciate anything anybody's able to do. That type of material is just so much more dense. Too. Yes. Yes, it really is. So let me ask Claire how you've recruited volunteers and transcribers for these projects? Well, really similar to Meredith. And actually, so Alabama started their World War One service card project, and then we started ours um, really piggybacking off of them right afterwards. As they were starting to um, finish theirs, we launched ours. And so a lot of Meredith's volunteers um, jumped over to our project, um, as well as just other volunteers who were already on from the page. So. I had actually just um, started the project, and I, th I think this must have been 2018, and um, was just going to practice. I told, told my mom about it, and I wanted my mom to like get on and, and try a couple of cards and you know let me know what she thought about it. And then I came into work the next day, and like hundreds of cards were completed, <laughs> and not by my mom. And I was you know not intending that at all, but it was amazing. I mean, it took zero work to get these um, these volunteers, which is great. And then from there, we um, we sent out emails to like some targeted listservs and genealogy groups and genealogy newsletters, um, you know, trying to kind of focus on people who 
who had benefited on other online from other online resources or knew how hard it is to find this information and, and what they would be like contributing and how helpful that would be. Um, and I think we've probably had a, a similar experience to Alabama in terms of starting with a project that was so easy and simple. And with the World War I cards, I mean, you could just like really fire through a, a quite a few of those which I think was, um, you know, it was easy, um, low learning curve, it was fun. I think being able to get through so many cards in a few minutes could be really interesting to people who are seeing, um, you're able to then just see more cards and see trends. Um, at one point I had sent out a survey to our volunteers and one of the questions I asked was, you know, what are you enjoying about it? And um, so many of the answers were like, enjoying seeing the um, the towns that people were from and the different geographical um, information. And I hadn't expected that really. But, um, and so then I think shifting towards the, the projects that can feel like a little bit more of a slog where you're on the same page for a while, it's not always the same person who's interested in that. And so we haven't done a whole lot of recruitment since that first big push where we kind of got our, our big set of volunteers. Um, but it may be something to think about now that our projects have shifted a little and with the spreadsheet transcription option and, and the types of projects are a little different that maybe it is time to keep recruiting a little bit more. But I mean, similar to Meredith, it's all, it's all awesome to get it done. So there is no, you know, we're not trying to finish it by tomorrow or, you know, it's just all extra. But it's extra that people really benefit from, right? So I think in, in this particular conversation that genealogists really love, which I think kind of leads into my next question, which is, you know, what do you do with the results of these projects once they, you know, once you've, you've had an index created or you've got transcription for a bunch of cards or a land office record or immigration records or any of these, where, where does it go or what do you do with it? How do people find it and use it? We, we unmuted and muted at the same time. <laughs> sure the tag teaming are going in alphabetical order. Um, but uh, so we use we use a software called Content DM for our digital collections. And because all of the records that we are either transcribing or indexing and from the page, also we've all, for the, for those we've also digitized the original records. We're putting those original records in our digital collection and that is where the information goes as well. So the World War One cards initially, we had uploaded them in batches by county and by surname. And then after we got the card level information, we broke those batches apart. So now when you do a search, you just pull up the cards that have your search terms. And with the, um, the we're gonna do the same thing with the voter registration books that we have. The entire books are in Content DM but the individual records will be uploaded there as well so that you can go and browse a book if you want to, but you can also do a search for a particular person and pull up the page that's relevant to them, but also the details from it. So that's where that's where we are, in, are intending to put any information we get from, from the page. It, it, that's a letter or if it's just an, an indexing project like that, just because that's where all of our digital content is now. Do you see more use from those collections once the once they're indexed or once they're transcribed? Do you have a way to track that? So I was I I, I actually content is not great on statistics. So I went month by month for the three genealogical collections that we did, and I now have a spreadsheet that I can update as needed. Um, just trying to all that content DM gives you is page views per month, and so I have to go back to when the collection was first put online versus when it was fully transcribed. And the, the thing that this doesn't capture is how much more use it gets simply because it is digitized. Because these records weren't easy to get to at all before. So just having them online, even if they aren't indexed, makes them more accessible and people can kind of drill down to what they want. But after we have put in the individual entries, numbers have increased, like the average for the World War I cards I was actually surprised by how much use there was before we had any searchable, you know, entries, but people would have to like navigate to a batch of cards and then click through a bunch to find what they needed. So I think that's why the numbers are so high. So it's like we had 722 
page views a month before all the entries were online and then like 1,011 a month average after they were all online. And with our um, home address reports, which was the second project we did also military typed cards, uh, the, the entries, uh, the page views per month doubled. Uh, with the, I will be really interested to see with the voter registration books because we have not put any of those entries back in yet. We have, we're about two thirds of the way through that project. Nancy, I, I mentioned our head of reference is, is reviewing each page and she's about two thirds of the way through her review as well. So we're about to start putting entries in. I mean, we've got, there are about 1200 page views a month as is, which I was shocked by, but people know about the records and are, are willing to, to click through the pages to, to try to read them. So I will be interested. I'm, hap I'm happy to have this information now so that in a couple of months we can compare and see how much more use we get once people can actually search and find. And I was also wondering, um, as I was looking at the numbers, because they vary wildly from month to month, I'm wondering how much of a connection there is between like programming we have at the archives, where our, our reference staff does a workshop on a genealogical topic. Like, let's say we're going to talk about military records. I'm wondering how much of that connects to the boost that I see in the numbers as far as when people are learning about these collections and using them for the first time. So that would be interesting to track. I don't think I can, but. Yeah. So Claire, what about you? What do you do with the results once you've either transcribed or indexed material? So we have um, a searchable index site, um, the Research Indiana Indexes, that will then add our completed projects to. Um, and I, I mentioned when we started using From the Page, we had an older index site. And at that time, we actually had entirely lost the ability to update it. It was, you know, that old. Um, and so we were relying on the searchability functions of From the Page, even for our completed projects of pointing people to using them there. Um, now, fortunately, we have the ability to just add the completed projects as part of our, our full index. Um, some of the projects that we have worked on have been um, more focused on like ease of access internally. So like we did um, a project for our Lake County naturalization records. And so Lake County is um, a really big populist county in Indiana. It's near Chicago. And they had um, three different courthouses. And so people were being naturalized at different courthouses. And the average um, patron didn't know what courthouse um, they were from, and the indexes were different. And it was a, a collection that our reference archivist reported was just challenging to use. And so we haven't noticed more people asking about Lake County naturalization records because I think you you know you either need them or you don't, but it's so much easier for us now to access them. Um, and you know that anytime you're able to do that, then we're able to, you know, give more help elsewhere and answer more questions. And so that's been a big like internal um, improvement that we've seen. You know, we've heard similar stories from the Maryland State Archives who is, uh, they're digitizing a bunch of marriage records and just having the index that the staff can use even to help people find things mm -hmm. is, has been a, a win right. there. Well, and anytime you have, you know, like an, an analog, you know, a um, card index, something could just be misfiled, you know, and, and so you're not able to see it. And so once you have it digital, you can really know for sure that you're um, able to find the entry. You know, one of the things that we have, I haven't actually thought about needing to track or trying to track on from the page, but um, we, we, we focused about a year ago and from the page on improving our, our search engine optimization, right? So Google can find the stuff that we have and, and people can stumble across it easier. Um, and we were talking to a, a historic cemetery outside of Boston the other day. And she's like, oh yeah, when I'm looking for something, I just Google for it and it shows up and from the page and then, and then it'll take me straight to the page I was <laughs> looking for. And we're like, Wow. Okay, that's fascinating. <laughs> that Google helps you get to these records, right? Um, and and this idea, you know, they they are not a state archive; they're a much smaller institution, and they don't have a good place to put all of their transcripts, and so they just they keep them on from the page. And we're not we're not a, a digital asset management system; we're just a crowdsourcing system. But it's interesting to hear these stories that people are starting that you know. 
but to search help people are doing yes. search and research. Yeah. So, what are the next collections you have that you think would benefit from crowdsourcing? Uh, not not to tip your hand on like anything, <laughs> any any special surprises you have planned, but you know, just maybe in general terms, or if you're willing to share specifics. Um, well, so we're currently working on um, the 1862 um, draft enrollments, um, Civil War enrollments um, from Indiana. And that project actually came about because um, one of our archivists, archivists was giving um, a genealogy presentation at a local library. And they said, you know, we really wish we could use these records. Mm -hmm. And so that came like directly from some of our users asked for, for this to be done. Um, so I say that, I guess, because if, you know, if anybody has ideas, please send them our way and we, you know, we're happy to do the things that people are wanting to use. Um, otherwise, um, I think we, we're trying to kind of round out some of our collections that are, are already partially indexed. And so like some um, might do some coroner's records or professional um, professional licenses, that kind of thing. We have um, a volume from the Indiana State Teachers Association from the 1800s that is kind of neat. Um, so and we also have a new archivist who is taking on um, the From the Page project. So it'll be fun to see um, what he discovers like in our collections that may really speak to him as good options. I remember that Indiana State Teachers Association records because when we uh, developed kind of the spreadsheet transcription feature from the page, that was the example you had sent us. Right, that was one of our tests, that's yeah. A neat, um, it's a very yes. interesting um, document because it tells you a lot about a moment in time, someone, you know, trying, you know, becoming a teacher and what they were doing and where they were. So I, yeah. you know, it's, you get these stories, right? This is part of what we all love about these projects is the stories. Um, How about you, Meredith? What's, what's next for, for your projects? Yeah. So I'm meeting with y'all, I think in a couple of weeks to talk about <laughs> this. Um, it occurred to me since we're two thirds of the way through our big project now, I need to come up with something. Um, we do have a, a, a traditional transcription project going on, which is open. It's like uh, governor's papers and the people are people are finding it and again, adopting this collection, which we really appreciate. We've done absolutely no publicity for that. But as far as indexing, um, we have uh, I had mentioned that one of our valuable collections for genealogists are our prison records, and some of those are in Ancestry, but not nearly all of them. And there's an entire floor in one wing of our building that's just filled with records from the Department of Corrections that were never fully um, transferred. And they're very old, but you know, have, nothing's really been done with them. So our collection staff is working hard to you know, make an inventory of them and very slowly chip away at processing them. And after books are processed, we are going ahead and digitizing them and adding them to a relatively new digital collection we have all called Alabama Incarceration Records. And a lot of these volumes are registers like uh, convict labor, which is critically important, um, escapees, just um, list of prisoners at particular places. There's one that even includes like uh, the walls, which is a women's prison in Wetumpka. So these are, we've already digitized these and I'd kind of forgotten like, but we digitize them with indexing in mind. Um, so I think that now that we have the spreadsheet format, this will be a good opportunity after just, you know, take it one piece at a time, get through one book at a time and start working on some of those. Um, a slightly less traditional indexing way of looking at indexing. Um, we've, we're also digitizing all of our Supreme Court case files, state Supreme Court case files from 1820 to 1877. And that is that's a project that will probably outlast me because it's about 500 volumes and a volume could have a dozen cases or it could have 60. So it just they take a lot of time and a lot of uh, digital space as well. So um, it's, it's sort of slow going, but we've got over a thousand cases online now. And we've had a couple of interns and one of our in-person volunteers who have been transcribing some of those. And we're focusing on cases in which African Americans or Native Americans or women, you know, un traditionally underrepresented parties are 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 parties of the case. Um, in some cases, it's it's a little bit it's more indirect. Like in a state case, may be a dispute between heirs, but the entire text of a will will be included, and every enslaved person on part part of that estate will be listed out. So this is a an incredible way to find people 
in a place that most people don't think to look or know to look or aren't able to because for years and years you had to come here, you had to know about the collection, you had to know which book to pull. It was just very difficult to use. So simply digitizing those records and putting them online has made them a lot more accessible. But but these are extra challenging because you have the dual challenges of 19th century handwriting and legalese. So the more the more transcription we can do, the better. So that would be a traditional transcription project, but with the aim of not just understanding for scholarly research, but also finding people. So those I think will be a, a really great resource for genealogists as well. We just need to think about how we're going to do that. So right now it's it's behind closed doors. We have an intern, but we're we're gonna open this up to the public eventually. So we need to do that in a, a thoughtful manner when we do. And then another thing we've been thinking about doing that sort of fits in this category is um, y'all, one of the things that y'all developed was the metadata feature and it's like joint uh, transcription and metadata where you can use the form format. But we've got, we've received a large audiovisual collection a couple of years ago and we're in the process of getting a lot of those tapes and film reels digitized, but there's also a fabulous uh, photograph collection. And so this was like our, our local NBC affiliate WSFA here in Montgomery. And all of these photographs um, that have been done, and there is a small but mighty contingent of alums still around who worked at the station in the 60s and 70s. And we had talked about how great it would be to have like a photo identification day or something, but with COVID and everything, it just hasn't worked out. So we're thinking about, and I've gotten approval too, we just haven't started yet, digitize selections from the photograph collection and put them online, you know, for this particular group so that they can go through and identify people. And then we can take that information and put it back into our, our digital collection, in more traditional metadata format. So that's a way to perhaps use from the page, you know, not just with documents, but also because because sometimes only the people in the community know who the people in your photograph are. And we've had really great projects before where we've had like, you know, community identification, um, you know, go on going on the local news and saying, does anybody know who these people are? And it's just it's just one of those fun ways to connect with your users in ways you don't usually get to. And so I think that this might be a, another way to do that more broadly. Yeah, we have a, a university that's uh, digitized a bunch of dance posters from performances on campus in the 80s and they're it's a closed project but they're inviting the alumni of that program to come in and help them identify you know performances the, they were yes, in or involved yeah, yeah exactly more de details about that so it's kind of fun um so I guess our next question is do you have any advice for, I guess, two-parted again, genealogists who want to volunteer, but maybe genealogists who want to encourage their, their local institutions to consider projects like this? How do you, how do they have those conversations? Where do they have those conversations? Or on the on the, the other hand is, you know, how do they just find projects and work on them? If, if that's because because moving institutions is sometimes hard, right? But um... well, I know. Um... You know, for us, at least one of the roadblocks is we're not digitizing, you know, nearly as much as Alabama, for example, is. And you need digital images to be on from the page. And so um, that could be something that is a roadblock for for certain institutions. And um, the way that we've kind of gotten around that has been focusing on um, doing card indexes that we can really easily scan. It's not a big ask to, to scan those. And then also records that have already been microfilmed. Um, it's very easy for us to, fortunately, we have the ability to create digital images from our microfilm without, um, without putting a big burden on our um, microfilm staff. So um, we've kind of focused our projects on what we have available and what is possible to, to put on from the page. And that is maybe an easier way to, an easier entry point for um, some places. Right. How about you, Meredith? Any advice? Great question. Um, for, for people who are wanting to volunteer, who have found a project, um, we try to provide guidance and, you know, uh, guides and things like that. But but really, like, we're open to questions or critiques, um, nice ones preferably, but we'll take <laughs> them all. Um, you know, if you if you're working on something and you don't know, I mean, please ask. 
uh, because we want to make sure that you're comfortable as you're doing your work and that 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 benefits everybody because that makes sure that everyone everyone knows that they understand the instructions the right way and that will uh, create better information that we can then take out and put into our systems. And as far as finding projects, there are just so many. I don't know how people come across ours sometimes. It's, it's, we, we benefit sometimes because we start with A, I know. Um, <laughs> there's just so many, you know, I, I had a student, um, a couple new volunteers uh, over the past week, and one of them was like a retired librarian who was just looking for something to work on. And she started working on our Civil War uh, governor's papers and, and was enjoying that. And she had several questions. And then the other was a student who had to do community service hours. And she came across our site and she put in an hour of work and I signed off on her form. So it's just, you know, and also like if you have kids who kind of understand cursive, like this is a great way to, to just get them used to it, get into like one of our in-person volunteers, very young, and he came in and he's like, well, my mom taught me cursive and I write in it all the time. And then we started looking at the records and he's like, what does that say? I was like, I'm pretty sure that's Thomas. He's like, that doesn't look the cursive I know, but it's great experience for him. Um, and we'll, you know, keep it going for another generation if we find those young folks and if you give them a place to practice and learn. We, uh, you know, we work with a lot of universities and there was a freshman history class that worked with um, some 1910s records that were in cursive and that they found it impossible at first. And then within a day or two, they were, they were doing it right. It's, mm -hmm. it's a puzzle and it's a challenge, but you feel like you've, you've overcome, right. That you've, right. You, you've accomplished something, you have a new skill and everyone loves that feeling. Oh <laughs> I'm going to just second uh, Meredith's comment about asking questions and, you know, feeling comfortable writing in the comments or sending an email. Um, you know, something that we've noticed with some of our larger projects is that the, um, the records can change drastically as you move through the project that maybe we didn't notice when we were setting it up. You know, if you've got a new clerk um, or just a new book starts and all of a sudden they're doing something totally different. And um, and I think, you know, if people may think that they should know how to do it, but actually it's entirely different than the way we thought you were going to do it. So so you asking us is what's allow allowing us to even notice that that's happening and and kind of change the way we're approaching it. And on our end, we're trying to um, kind of learn that the hard way and are now trying to do a better job of like spot checking throughout a big project before you start it just to make sure what I think these records are is what they are throughout the whole project. One of the things um, I guess for genealogists to, to consider some other stories. So in Michigan, the state archives in Michigan are just started some projects, but they're partnering with their local Daughters of the American Revolution chapters, um, all the different chapters in the state. So it's a really interesting closed project. And they're, those ladies are very competitive on getting their, their work right. done. Um, so it's kind of a different approach to, because the volunteers kind of came together and worked with the archives. And we've seen that actually in Tennessee as well. A lot of the genealogy society leaders in Tennessee really pushed the Tennessee State Archives to to, to think about projects like this and to partner with them on it. So it's interesting as, as a genealogist, how you can, you know, start having those conversations and it, it takes a while and you have to find the right project and you have to collaborate even at that stage. Right. But um, the, the DAR example was, was interesting because I mean, I'm a genealogist and I have had the experience of, of kind of walking into a clerk's office and saying, well, I want this. And I'm like, well, what do you, you know, where, where are you coming from? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but the DAR example, right, that you've got this group of volunteers who want to do this kind of work, who come together and say, all right, through our organization, our organization can approach the, the archives of Michigan and say, we really want to work on these World War One service cards. And that that's a little bit more credibility, I feel like. Well, and it's also, you know, what you're as an institution, you're never sure whether these projects are going to be successful, right? This is always risky. And um, when when a group of potential volunteers comes to you, that that reduces so much of the risk because you know you have 
people who are passionate, who are committed, um, who have a track record of doing great work. Um, and that just makes projects so much more successful. So I think that's worth thinking about if you're, if, I know our call today is probably about half institutions, half genealogists. So, you know, as a genealogist, you, you can have some influence uh, over your institutions. It just takes time and patience. And as a representative of an institution, like, I think we would love that if a group was like, if you will do these, we will take care of them for you. And and I, I, I mean, that would be, so if anyone is interested in the Alabama collections, contact me after. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so on the other hand, do you have any advice for libraries and archives that are contemplating crowdsourcing projects to better serve genealogists? Do you have any, you know, painful lessons learned or you know, ideas on, on how to get started or or just just general advice? I liked Claire's earlier about, you know, go for your low hanging fruit. <laughs> um, and I feel like you both talked about doing easy projects first, like the World War One service cards. They're so satisfying because they go so fast. And both of yeah, those I, I think easy projects are good wins. You know, we've we've had a little bit of a um I've had a little bit of a fail with one of our projects um, that has just been too hard. Um, yeah, we tried to do these Jeffersonville um, land office records and and maybe I'll try again. I just, I just um, we had one person who was really working on it and he's actually happens to be an in-person volunteer too. And so I may end up just shifting it to his personal project. Um, but I think it just was, it's too difficult. And, and I also wonder, so, um, so it's our land records and it, they document the sale of land in Indiana and some version of that information is available online from the um, Bureau of Land Management. And the value of the state records is that they can place someone in Indiana a little bit earlier than the actual patent went through on BLM's website. And so um, genealogists do let, you know, those couple of years can really matter. But I wonder if letting people know that there is this information in another source was not attractive to, to volunteers of maybe they're more interested in something that, you know, truly is unfindable. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Meredith, do you have advice? Um, yeah, just I think trying to remember that our projects need to be mutually beneficial to both our institution, but also something that's like you were saying, Claire, like rewarding for the volunteers who are working on it too. Like they're going to be interesting to them or a challenge to them they want to accept. And and being patient and understanding that um, a lot of people may be really excited at first, and a lot of people are not going to stay that excited throughout, but don't get discouraged by that because more than likely, in most cases, you will find some volunteer, somebody who connects with your stuff, because we're all different, you know, people like to do different things, people are interested in different things. So even though like with our voter registration books right now, not as many people stuck with it, and I understand why, but we have a couple who are just every day working on it, and we couldn't do it without them, but, you know, just don't be discouraged, do not despair <laughs> if, if things seem to be going slowly, and it's okay not to have a fast project. If you do have a deadline, I think you're like, we, we, we benefited with World War One because as I've said often before, um, we, that we were, there were some anniversaries coinciding. So it was the centennial of World War One and the bicentennial of Alabama. And so we had a lot of momentum from that anyway. So if you can time your projects to coincide with commemorative periods or anniversaries, things like that, where people are already thinking about these things and you can maybe partner with, you know, we had the tourism, um, not tourism, we had a bicentennial commission and some of the people involved in that were really excited about our World War I project. It's just another way to promote and get people engaged and, and get things knocked out. But you do, it, it's not gonna happen with the harder with the harder records. So again, World War I cards were typed. They were fairly easy and straightforward, but handwriting um, can be a slog, but it's, it's, it's so critical. And then also just let your volunteers know how much you appreciate them. And that even if, because sometimes people want to volunteer and they'll write and say, you know, I can't commit a lot of time or what are the time requirements? And I'm like, any time you can give us is fine. If it is 15 minutes one day, 
that is that is a little bit of work we would not have had otherwise. So we appreciate everything everybody does because we know that you're just giving us of your time. And that's um, we, we 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 couldn't get we couldn't do this work without our volunteers. So just be appreciative of everything that they are able to to do. And then one other thing, um, we've had this conversation before too with y'all about uh, how much review do you do of the work that is done by your volunteers? And that has changed for us depending on the project and our staffing levels. So just it, just uh, decide from the start what level of review you are able to do and what you are satisfied with. Because there are some records like the voter registration, like I said, we have someone now who can review every page and she's the best possible person to do that. We would not be able to do that if she were not coming back part time with the World War One cards. We they were simpler records. The instructions were fairly clear. And so we didn't do a lot of item level review on those. We decided that if there were mistakes, we could fix them as we found them and that what we were able to generate was better than nothing. But I know different institutions have different rules for that. So just be aware of what your um, administration expects and what you can actually realistically um, achieve. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important too. So those are all the questions that we had prepared. Um, so we'd like to open it up for questions and probably start with some of the questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, so I'm going to read one out from John Dugan at the Missouri State Archives says that uh, corrections records are popular with their customers as well. Are you targeting all of the summary registers first or all the records for a certain time frame? And I'm not sure whether this is to Meredith or Claire or both. Meredith was talking more about corrections records. Yeah, for us, we're doing whatever is getting processed. So really, I'm, I'm not sure how the collection staff is deciding what, like I said, the, the transfer of these records, they're still having to work on that because it's some of those things that have just been in the building forever and they should be here, but it's a slow process to get things officially, formally um, transferred from one agency to another. So I really don't know what their criteria are. They are, they seem to be pretty varied right now. And, and they're also, I should say, these have been intern projects over the summer. So they're trying to find records that aren't going to overwhelm the interns. So it's more about the form, individual formats and particular sets of sets of information right now. Let's we see. Should, great question, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Eileen Mosley had a question. Um, do you have any issues with copyright laws for photographs when posting them online? Um, in general, or just for what I had been talking about? Well, I'll say with that collection I mentioned, we did get copyright to the content that I'm proposing that we put online. And copyright's kind of tricky anyway. A lot of times we don't know um, orphan works and, and such things. If anything is clearly going to be problematic, we don't put it online. And as we are um, accepting collections from entities that have created the content, we do ask that copyright be transferred to us. But there's older material that it's it's a little, it's a bit of a gray area, but we avoid anything that's truly problematic. And if any issues are brought to our attention, we take things down. And one of the ways that you can kind of use from the page for that is there's a footer that you can configure to show up on every page, right? So you want to put a DMCA takedown notice that shows up on every single page you can do that, right. right? So that's you know one tool in your arsenal of tools to think about the copyright, especially in the gray areas. So John Dugan leaves a comment by one of the comments that I think Claire said that impressed all of us that um, changes within a project is also true for them, um, that there are projects that span a really long time period of time or are from very different counties where the clerks did things differently. Um, that's, that's, definitely widespread. Um, so I thought Clara's point about spot checking on the one hand mm -hmm. or listening to volunteer questions and learning about your own collections from that was really good. Did you have anything to add to that, Claire, at all? Well, I think it can also be um, a challenge as a, as a volunteer when the clerks, for example, change because you've gotten used to someone's handwriting and all of a sudden it's a, a totally different person writing it. Um, so, and I, I think from the page helps with that a little bit in, in terms of setting up works. And so you can have a certain person working on a particular work, which is 
probably going to be the same handwriting and maybe somebody else is in a different area using a different clerk's um, transcription. But, you know, you can feel like you've, you've figured someone out and then all of a sudden you've got somebody new. That's yeah. why one of the things that we try to do is present pages in order so that you can just keep working on the same handwriting right. until, until it's done, all right? And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, let's see, we had a, a question from Betty Brownwell about do projects need to be initiated from institutions or can individuals set up projects? Um, so we don't have a ton of individuals who run projects on from the page, but we do have a handful of genealogy groups who do. So the Tennessee genealogy. Uh, so the Tennessee State, yeah. but, uh, sorry, it's the Nashville chapter of the African Afro-American Genealogy Society of Tennessee. And there's another, but there's another, there's, they're, you know, genealogists, they're involved in all the organizations right. that apply to them. So they, there's another one, I think that's statewide as well. Yeah. Um, uh, the African American Genealogy Society of Tennessee group is running a project in which they have uploaded um, black newspapers, and they are having people index names within them. So don't is, transcribe all the articles, just scan for names and put them in a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet has you know, obviously it's linked to the page that you're transcribing, but it also has fields for what column it is, and is this in an advertisement or an article or things like that. And then a little bit of information, I think, about the person. Does it mention their, you know, occupation or, or something? Um, so yeah, it's possible for individuals to to do projects. It's from the page starts at hundred dollars a month. You decide if it's worth it for your right. projects, right? If if it's if it's just you working on it, maybe it isn't. Um, we really because we focus so much on the the collaboration piece and and kind of sharing the workload. Right. Um, so can we drop a link into that newspaper project? I will see if I can find one. Thank you, Sonia. And then while I'm looking for that, um, if anyone has other questions, um, maybe you can. Uh, either quickly unmute yourself or attempt to raise your hand if you can figure out how to do that in Zoom. I, I You're also welcome myself. to drop it into the chat. <laughs> That's yeah. easier, whatever uh, to do. I think this question was asked maybe at the COSA BPE uh, conference, but I'd like to ask it again, I guess, here too. How many uh, pages or cards uh, does it take for a volunteer to actually get, I call it burn-in, but where that they can just comfortably work on a project? Meredith, Claire? <laughs> I don't know the answer to this one. I don't maybe, know. Maybe a volunteer can answer. can answer that. Yeah, that's. I think that's a, and it depends on the the project and and the volunteer. Um, because that's. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I've never like tried to go through and extract information. Um, and then like with, much like y'all have been saying, handwriting changes. Like you may get two pages in and be all in, and then a new registrar comes on whose handwriting is absolutely illegible, and you're like, I'm done. I don't. I don't know what the magic magic number is you know one of the things that we try to do when you we have lots of different kind of ways we try to help institutions do review and one of the things we highlight is brand new transcribers we're like this person's never been reviewed before that's the time to look and to intervene as early as possible because then you can kind of help answer questions make some guidance um and kind of watch and see if if they're burning in or not in, in john's terms and and i would say that there's so much difference between projects um definitely if i'm working with 19th century diaries it takes probably eight to ten hours before i really feel comfortable with what's going on and that involves me going back and you know updating page one with what i learned from page you know page four i finally figured out that's a w okay suddenly that makes sense um, but we've seen projects that are typewritten index cards in which, I mean, there, there's one project that uh, Maryland. Maryland State Archives is running right now that's, they're asking seven questions about typewritten cards. And there's one volunteer that when she gets going, she has been processing a hundred cards an hour. 
which just <laughs> blows me away. It actually didn't blow Ben away. It scared him that somebody was doing something inappropriate in <laughs> the system and we had to go uh, dig into it to figure out what was going on. And we're like, no, this is totally legit. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's doing great work. She's yep. a typist and these are typewritten and easy to read. Yeah. But it probably, if you look back at the stats, it probably was 20 uh, an hour, her first hour. And then, you know, I just, I'm afraid that volunteers give up too soon before they actually reach that critical mass. You're like, we, we're not at breakaway speed yet. And they just stop. And, and I think if they would stick with it, then they become those super users. Well, I think, you know, the... Some of the best ways to get people there or get people much more comfortable and it's just there's a lot of overhead but these in-person transcribathons are you know library of virginia sonia's on but they do them i think, I think they do one in person once a month and one over zoom once a month um and it's you know it gets you over the discomfort of i don't know what i'm doing i it lets you collaborate like out loud with with people um it just I, not every institution has the space and the capacity to do that. So, Sonia is backing us up, but Sonia, if you want to unmute yourself and pitch you on your way, <laughs> yeah. Sure, I'm here. Um, I'm just very backlit because I'm in my office. Um, yeah, we do a two hour transcribe on twice a month. Um, and that is just for these reasons to help people get over that hump of feeling uncomfortable. And also we can sort of work with them and assess their skill level and steer them towards collections where we think they will be successful. We try to have a range of different collections available so that some may be very difficult older handwriting. Um, some may be a very neat and precise clerk. We love them. Um, some may be a mix of typed and handwritten that are a little bit more modern. Uh, we try to have a lot of different things going so that we can point people in the right direction. I think that's an interesting way to to kind of match your volunteers to to collections and try to you know, get your more experienced people who are more comfortable working on your your harder material and use those easier collections for for your entry point. I think we have sort of a process of skills development that is difficult to do uh, virtually. It does work better in person where you can meet someone and steer them towards the level you think is appropriate for them. But often we try to, again, yeah, start our volunteers in those easier collections and then graduate them up, up the chain and difficulty. And uh, I'm dropping a link on anyone who'd like to hear more of Sonia. She will be presenting at our <laughs> next webinar. <laughs> with Lydia Sneak on, on their, their, one of their projects. That's Sneak right. On that one. Um, we have two minutes left. But would anyone like to try to get in a last mm -hmm. quick question? Um, I see a question from um, Patty about what indexing um, database we're using. So originally pre from the page, most of our in-person indexes were created using access. Um, and now um, we, we use something called Axiom, which just a few state archives use. And we're basically uploading um, CSV files um, into Axiom. So I can, I'll put a link to our, our index page just in case anybody has any Indiana ancestors. Excellent. Awesome. And uh, let me just call out a, a note by Eileen that um, as she reviews all of the Gold Rush collections, which are handwritten letters by different people, um, it's it takes a few days to get used to each new hand. <laughs> so I, I recommend reading her comment in full. And I believe we are at time. Thank you all so much for attending. And thank you especially to Claire and Meredith, uh, our fabulous presenters. and volunteer coordinators. Thank you.